Greetings, Salaam Alaikum, my name is Sakib and welcome to another episode of the Hikmah Project Podcast. I've taken a bit of a break and are, alhamdulillah, back with a new episode with Dr. Eric Winkle. If you're listening to this uh, podcast in Ramadan, Ramadan Kareem to you and may you receive the blessings of this blessed month. In this podcast, we speak to uh, Dr. Eric Winkle or Sidi Shoaib on the relevance of the Quran in the teachings of Ibn al-Arabi. We look at how his work isn't necessarily a commentary on the Quran, but rather is deeply immersed in the Quran and how he's able to access this shoreless ocean through looking at uh, quite a, a literal approach to interpreting the Quran. He's not a literalist, but looks at the root words of the Arabic language to be able to derive multiple levels of meaning, as Sidi Shoy will explain. Thank you to those who are who have subscribed to our Patreon subscription and are supporting the project. You can find out more details on the hikmaproject.com as well as visit our Facebook page and um, social media sites on Instagram and Twitter. So without further ado, here's a podcast. Hey, Asalaamu Alaikum. Welcome, Dr. Winkle. Asalaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wonderful to uh, have you again as our guest. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Alhamdulillah. So, Sidi, could you maybe start off just by telling us uh, or giving us an update on uh, your translation work with the Fatuhat al Makia of Ibn Arabi? Okay. So, for the, for the first, uh, well, I end up doing many, many, many drafts of the translation. In fact, with chapter one, a few years ago, I, I found out how many times I had visited the file chapter one, and it was already in the thousands. So I make drafts all the time. Um, and so I'll say first draft, but it means like the first 10 drafts. So right now, I'm at about book 28 with, uh, a, with, a, with a draft, which has been over about 10 times or so, um, which except for the kind of uh, editing that Rowan Hayes does for us, um, it's very much ready. It's 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 been translated, and so all the way up to book twenty eight is pretty much where I am right now. So I've kind of instead of moving onwards from there, I've I've been concentrating on getting the earlier books ready uh, for for Rowan and and also get them ready for publication. And so right now we hope to be having book volume five, which means book nine and ten volume six which is 11 and 12 and volume seven and eight we may even go up to volume eight by the end of this year inshallah so uh, we're ready to move quite quickly it's been 10 years now since i started the the project uh in in its exclusive and 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 all consuming way uh that's been 10 years now and so i think things are going to be moving quickly now so that's there and then parallel to this work uh I, I've done all those Friday sessions, and and we we did you know, all the way through from 2021, um, it, well, it'd be for 2020, 2021. Uh, so we've done all of these Friday sessions every week, and so they're all on YouTube now. And and the visuals, uh, what we've uh, what I've done is I've collaborated with an artist of the Islamic creative imagination, and we've come up with a a way of understanding the 28 or so concepts that you need to understand in Ibn Arabi. And we've come up with an illustrated or visual way to do that. And the, the product is an illustrated guide to Ibn Arabi. And Peer Press uh, is publishing it. And it is already, uh, it's ready, already coming out. Um, I'm getting, my copies have come, are, are on their way right now. And people have already been get, getting their, their, their copies when they pre-ordered. So uh, that's on Peer Press. So go to peerpress.com and, and you'll see the illustrated guide to Ibn Arabi. And so these are, this is something that's so much helped my, the, the translation work because it's, it's really 
pushed me to, to visualize things, to see things. Ibn Arabi sees things very visually. And, and he's he, all of these, when he sees letters, he sees beings, he sees human beings, and he sees these awliya, and their letters, and their grammatical uh, forms, and, their, and, and he sees syntax everywhere, he sees grammar everywhere. And that used to be the way, I mean, like this and some others used to see that the universe is a grammar, uh, because there are certain rules that are followed for communication. And so Allah follows rules in the universe so that he can communicate with us. So uh, it is very visual, it's very uh, graphic and, and close and palpable. Uh, Ibn Arabi sees these things very, very physically as well. So this, and so the next, we'll, we'll be wanting to do some more work after this, uh, which will go parallel with the translation project. Wow, fascinating. And Sidi, just for our listeners who may not have delved into the Meccan openings of the Fujuata Makia, how many books are there all together? Yeah, so uh, the, the 37 books, uh, so I booked 28 right now and 28, 29, somewhere in there. And the, the other translations I have are very rough um, from, the, from that till the end. And I've been putting two books in each volume. So volume one is book one and two, then three and four is volume two. And so we're, because the books, um, the, the 37 books are very much part of what Ibn Arabi, uh, he uses the Jews, the manuscript part, and then he uses the, the book. Uh, and so that's, that's the division. And then I'm putting them two books in a volume. And so we're looking at 19 volumes. And so, uh, and 19 volumes will be stacked up pretty high. We're looking at it as probably about six feet tall or two meters tall <laughs> once we get all the books stacked up. So it's getting, uh, it's getting quite immense. It'll probably be, be 12,000 pages. The, the Arabic is about 10,000 pages. Fascinating. So Sidi, today's um, theme is the Quran in the works of Ibn Arabi, or more specifically the Futuhat al makiya Could you just start off by explaining or how important is the Quran in Ibn Arabi's work? Okay. Yes, yeah, so the one thing that, that that people when they when they begin to see well, well for the the work that I'm doing the openings revealed in Mecca that translation it's uh, translation commentary uh, when people it's and it's also meant to be very much complete so it's not excerpted or, or something like that it's the complete translation and so one thing that people notice well the first thing that you might notice is that the chapters all start with learn so the the imperative learn so this is all something Ibn Arabi wants us to understand and learn for ourselves. Uh, another thing they'll, they'll see is that they'll see Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam everywhere. And in the manuscript, the actual handwritten manuscript, uh, he doesn't do any honorific uh, sort of medallions or anything or any kind of abbreviation. He writes out Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it takes up about half of the page of the manuscript. So it's uh, if he was trying to uh, be a little more concise, he would have come up with an abbreviation, but he doesn't. And that shows the importance of honoring uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so every time I, so what I do is to make it uh, in a way easier for, for the reader, I put put a medallion there and the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in, um, in Arabic, and then the readers can, can read that and, and they can f make the text flow in a way that the traditional reader has no problem hearing that all the time. Uh, it's, it flows still. But for the you know, readers nowadays to make things flow, uh, it's important to have it, have it as a medallion. And so that's how we have it there. And so the first thing they'll see is that how many mentions there are of the Prophet Sallallahu It's absolutely central to everything he does. And then they'll also notice the Quran. And the Quran is, I'll look at this one page, a random page, uh, one verse, second verse, three verses, three verses on that page. Here we go, one verse, two verse, three verse, four verse, five verses on that page. So this is, the, the verses are always there, they're, they're everywhere. Every, the, every page has uh, an on, honoring of the Prophet and, and every page has a verse of Quran and many verses of Quran. And those, those last two, these things are actually quite connected and they're quite connected in a way that is also, it's, it's in a sense, it's in a sense the, and it's implicit. And so it's not necessarily spoken explicitly. It's implicit um, everywhere. Everything Ibn Arabi does is he, making something very imp implicit about the Quran and the Prophet And so if I, I guess I can bring that up right now to, to show 
why this is central to the Futuhat. And, and so we'll look at this in, in three different ways or, or, or so. But the first way, um, so where, where all of this is explicit is in the tariqat, uh, in, the, in the lineages, in the spiritual lineages. So Ibn Arabi explains to us very clearly that we are, that after the Prophet Sallallahu passes away, then uh, there's two things that happen. The first is that the Sharia, the outer Islam, the outward Islam, is transmitted and conveyed by Aisha. And so Aisha conveys the outward Islam. And then Fatima, his daughter, conveys the inner Islam, the tariqats. So we have Sharia is conveyed by Aisha, tariqa conveyed by Fatima. And so this is the these are the this is the way that this message uh, continues to be propagated and and to and to be as a waveform in the universe. And so what we what we look at then is this propagation of from Fatima, we begin to learn the implicit or the or the implied or the quiet or the secrets. And these are the ones that are not necessarily broadcast, but they the lineage holds them and conveys them. And one of the things the lineage conveys is that uh, they take from Aisha the statement that that the character of the Prophet Sallallahu is Quran. So his character is Quran. And then if you look at Ar-Rahman Alam al-Quran, so we look at Ar-Rahman, the supremely compassion, Alam al-Quran, taught the Quran. What the what we see in the lineage, what if, when we when we enter into this uh, to the secret, we enter into a place where the Nur Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Nur Muhammad is taught the Quran, and then Khalak al Insan created the human being. So the prophet was a prophet before Adam was in between water and clay, and so before humanity, there's the Nur Muhammad who is taught Quran. And then in, in the tariqas, we actually begin to look at the at the person of Muhammad وسلم, as Quran. And this we know from one of the ways that we we sing this in Allahi, uh, in the Jarahi tradition, uh, and in that Sheikh Noor translated. So it's in his in his words. Uh, we talk about Ya Ali, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, Ya Fatima, Alif Lam Mim. So these are the five under the cloak. So Alif Lam Mim is is a way of speaking of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and also Hamim, Yasin, uh, Taha, all of these. So what we then read is that when we look at Surah Al-Baqarah, we had Alif Lam Mim, Dalik Al Kitab Al Reba Fi. That is the book that has no doubt in it. And so who is that book? That book is Alif Lam Mim, and that is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we begin to uh, see that the Nur Muhammad is taught Quran, and then when the Nur Muhammad takes bodily form in Arabia uh, 1400 some years ago, that this becomes the person of Muhammad who is whose character is the Quran, and who is Alif Lam Mim, and who is, is the Quran. And I, we'll go. We'll, we'll look at some individual verses about this. But let me go ahead and just uh, say, read one one passage that Ibn Arabi has about this, about what, how the Quran and the and the person uh, come together are the same. So Aisha was asked about the character of Rasulullah, and she said his character is the Quran. There is no verse in the Quran, but the verse has a property in the heart of this slave of Muhammad sallam, because the Quran descended for this. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to, in his reciting of the Qur'an, when he passed through a verse of good fortune, versus feminine, she would rule him to ask God for his excellence, and he would ask God for his excellence. And when he passed through a verse of torment and threat, ruling him to take refuge in God from it, he would take refuge. And when he passed through a verse magnifying God, she ruled him to magnify God. And he glorified him with the character which this verse gave him, the praise of God. And when he passed through a verse of history and what came to pass, the divine force in the centuries before him, the verse ruled a heeding of the lesson. So he heeded the lesson. So this is exactly looking over the verses of the Quran and understanding the Quran. 
So what we see here is that the Quran, as it is being recited by him, and he's leading the prayer, he would respond to the verses. And this is something, uh, when I first saw that years ago, uh, in someone who would, they would, they would recite the Quran and then respond to it in their own voice and own language. And it is quite beautiful. This is the, this is the, our, our sunnah, is that we respond to the Quran as we hear it. And even if we're the Imam reciting the Quran for the, the Jamaat, uh, we still respond to the verses. And so one of the practices uh, in the lineage is that we, we have comments that come while we are reciting Quran. And the same way that if, you, if, if there's a verse about threats and torments, we say, I take refuge in, uh, in God from that. And so mm. we're always interacting with Quran. So this is the, the, that his character is the Quran. So Sidi, before we explore uh, particular verses of the Quran, could you just say something about the means through which Ibn Arabi interprets various Quranic verses? And the context of the question is, personally, I was really, really taken aback when I studied the secrets of voyaging with mm. uh, a parallel Arabic-English translation by Angela Jaffrey. I, I was um, taken aback by how literally on every line there was uh, a word or verse from the Quran. There was, you know, constant referencing. And uh, I, I hadn't found that to that extent in the Masnavi of Rumi. And not to say that isn't, you know, uh, immersed or uh, a commentary on the Quran. You know, I'm sure it's, it's a notion in and of itself. But to, to explicitly quote the Quran and again and again it, it was just quite mind-boggling but then the second thing that took me back was the level of literalism Ibn Arabi brings to his interpretation and by that I don't mean a dogmatic literalism but almost a literalism which puts the infinite at uh, almost the infinite within the domains of the finite saying that you do not need to go to X commentary or somewhere else, everything is enclosed within this finite domain. It's the ocean within the drop. And the way he was able to find the highest level of metaphysical meaning and depth within the subtle, within, you know, small nuances or subtle aspects of grammar uh, or, or letters, it was, it was just absolutely amazing. So, so could you say a bit more about that, his, his means of interpreting uh, right. verses of the Qur'an? Right. Yeah, almost always uh, his, his, his citation of Qur'an is, is half a verse or a clause of a verse. Um, it's, very, it's not really often it's a full verse and very, very rare that there's two verses. So what he's doing, as you say, the drop that, that contains the ocean, um, and he's looking at at each word and each word and its position is as has utter significance and so uh and there's a reason for that and there's a reason for how he is interpreting and in that it's not an interpretation it's not a commentary and let me kind of go into that so what happens is that that he says that there's a special face of huck in every created being and so every created being every created being has a, a special face and it's the first place that tajalli hits it's the first place the shining radiant brilliance hits and so each creature each of us and all of the creatures and all of creation has a special face which is you could say the mirror or the the veil or the place or the sh or the or the screen of a projection screen where the light hits the projection screen cast a shadow by the puppet and what you see is, is, is what we call reality. That special face is the first place that the Jali play comes to. And Ibn Arabi says that's the place where the Quran was revealed and the Torah and the Injil. It's also the place that when we're in Shura, so when we're in consultation, and when people are gathered in Shura and in consultation, suddenly someone will speak up and say something. And that what that person says will be revelation. What that person will say will be inspired. And at that moment, we know that that's the truth. And it could be a little kid, it could be an old woman, it could be a middle-aged man, it could be anyone. Because what they'll do is they'll be speaking from the special face 
of Haq, which is in every created being, where the Quran was revealed and the Torah was revealed and the Injil was revealed. So Ibn Arabi goes through the special face. So when he's doing this this writing and he's he's telling us, he's writing down what he saw etched in light in the photograph, etched in light in the youth, what he's doing is going to the special face that's in him and he is finding out where the Quran is coming from, the first place the Quran is revealed. And so when we uh, memorize the Quran, we have this very strange word, istashara, which is like from Zahir, Z-H-R, um, and it means to bring out the, the manifest Quran. And the way you bring about the manifest Quran is you go to the place where it was revealed. And so when you're at the special face, you're standing with the Prophet Wasallam. And Jibreel is bringing a verse. So when you go to the special face, you are there at the moment of revelation. And this is, why, this is why the people who know these secrets get into trouble because then they're saying, oh, but the prophet passed away and all of these things. But no, we have a, this is a living Nur Muhammad and we a living place where the Quran is a living Quran. And that's why Aisha said his character is the Quran. And so the special face is, uh, a verse comes to the special face. If you can go into that special face deep within, you will find the verse coming as if it was first repeat, as it was first revealed. And it is as if it's being revealed at that moment. And this is the place you will sit there, stand there, be there uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu while Jibreel is bringing a verse. Oh. And then, then this verse, then this verse, when you get this verse, it then goes up, it goes upwards, let's say it goes upwards into a more manifest place. And it goes upwards in seven different recitations. So these are the seven readings of Quran. So it goes Warsh and it goes Hafs and it goes up to these seven different places. And then it goes into translations and commentaries. And it goes into Lex Hickson, Sheikh Noor's heart of Quran. So it goes up in all of these places. But what Ibn Arabi is showing us is that you can't go from the top and go down into the special face. You can't take the Quran as it is recited and go backwards to the special face and understand it. So we cannot understand the Quran exoterically from the outside. We can only understand the Quran from the special face. So Ibn Arabi goes to the special face and then says this special face. So in one of the, what we did for six months is we looked at the 114 chapters corresponding to the 114 surahs of Quran in the Futuhat. And in these ones, Ibn Arabi would say, we're going to look at this alighting place. And now the alighting place might have been Surat al-Kaf or Surat Yasin. It'll be some surah. And he'll go into the special face and he'll describe in between six pages or 30 pages, he'll describe the special face of Yasin, the special face of Surah Al-Kaf. But he won't be quoting very many verses from Surah Al-Kaf. Because I always wonder, if you're going to be telling us about Surah Al-Kaf, let's say, won't you give us all the verses and go through each verse and explain them? He doesn't. He goes to the special face and gives us the insights, the truths of this Surah. And by citing other surahs and other verses, and maybe one or two of the verses of that particular surah. So that's because he went to the special face. And so you can understand the surah by coming from the special face upwards, but you can never go from the outward and the upper down into the meaning of Quran. And this is how uh, Sheikh Nur, when he wrote the heart of Quran, that's exactly where he is working from. He's working from the special face. And then it comes out in English, and it might it doesn't necessarily correspond to each verse, and it doesn't necessarily correspond to the Arabic translations. It's coming from the special face. So this is the heart of Quran. This is uh, that Ibn Arabi is telling us that if we want to understand Quran, we understand it from the special face. And so this actually reminds me of two things. One from Maulana Rumi when he talks about the shy bride, the Quran is like a shy bride. If you want to approach her, then do it through a friend, i.e. one of those olia who can access the special face. 
uh, presumably it, that's that's the same thing he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And then there's a beautiful poem by Iqbal um, in which he says, and I'll, I'll say it in order first, uh, there is a mere partak na ho na zule kitab, gira kasha hai na razi na sahib kashaf. So he says that until the book has hasn't been revealed on to your heart or your conscience, he doesn't use the word heart, but you know, on, on your zamir, then it remains a mystery whether whether you read, whether you're somebody who can write uh, tafsis like Fakhruddin Razi or, or you know, like Sahib Akashaf. All these commentaries really don't hold until it becomes, you read it from the special face. And I think there is a, there's another story around that uh, with Iqbal. I'll, I'll just mention it very quickly for any listeners who are interested, where he, he would recite the Quran in the morning and his dad, who was deeply inclined, in fact, in he had circles of Ibn Arabi. Uh, I think they used to read the Fasuls together, funny enough. And um, his dad would ask him every morning, what, what are you doing? And he says, I'm reciting the Quran. And then one day he, he's, he's, he asked his dad politely, you know, I recite the Quran every day. And yet you keep on asking me what I'm doing. And his dad said, yes, when you recite, recite as though it's being revealed to you. Mm -hmm. Right. That's it. That's beautiful. Yeah, that, this this is the this is the heart. And so uh, I have two two uh, sentences here to read. Uh, well, a few sentences, and this is from uh, the the illustrated guide. Uh, so so the Quran was sent down upon the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Quran never stops being sent down upon the hearts of his mother community until the day of arising for judgment. So the Quran is ever fresh. It's always being sent down to the mother community every day. Thus its descent onto the hearts is new, never getting old. So it is the perpetual revelation. It's the perpetual revelation. And learn, may God assist us and you, that the Quran is a renewed sight descending flush against the hearts of the reciters of him, the Quran, forever and ever. No one reciting him who recites him, except based on a renewing, descending from God, the all-wise and apportioning, the all-praised. So this is the, the living Quran, the perpetual Quran. Every time we recite, it's coming directly to the heart, to the special face, and we are reciting from there. And this is, this is what the mother community has access to. That, and so when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, it became midnight. And when it's midnight, you don't know where you're going. You don't have any light. So your best thing to do is to grab on to manuals of fiqh and uh, stations of the soul in tariqat and all of that. So you fix things down. You write them up. You make manuals and you make instructions. And you keep very strictly to these instructions because there's no light, because you're in midnight. But when the third part of the night comes, the third part of the night, when our Lord descends to the sky of this world, in the third remaining part of the night, asking, is there anyone asking for their separation to be covered over? So we say, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. So we're in the third part of the night. Ibn Arabi says we're in the third part of the night. So it's our time. So now we have the light, we have the living Quran. We are closer to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than the people who were living with him. We are closer to the, him. And when we recite Quran, we can recite directly as the, the revelation came for the first time. So it is the perpetual re re revelation. The descent on the heart is always new. And so we are in the third part of the night. We're in a very special time. And so uh, the Quran then becomes living. And so this is when now when we say Alif Lam Mim, Dhalik Al Kitab Ula Reba Fi, that one the Alif Lamim, is the book which has no doubt in it. And so this is the book that we read. And this is the book which is the Nur Muhammad Sallallahu because Al-Rahman, al Al-Quran, he taught the Quran. And he taught the Quran to the, before there was human, Wakhalak al-Insan, before there was humanity, he taught the Quran. To whom? The Nur Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, that is... Um... Uh, well, that was one of my questions, actually, about the sequence within Surah Rahman as to why the Quran is taught before humanity was created and then taught speech. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's and and um, 
this is always implicit and it's always a secret and and it's always uh so it's for each person to to re to read those verses and begin to understand for themselves and this is taqiq that is they they verify for themselves as ibn Rabi always tells us we verify for ourselves this the order of events and the order of events uh, from outside of time and then inside time and um, this order of events the sequence is in fact the story of creation it's why there is a creation so uh the so this arahman then settles on to the cosmic throne and so the settling onto the cosmic thrones means that arahman will be the one who is overseeing all things and that everything will then be is in kindness and ends up in kindness and the function of arahman is then to teach the nur muhammad this quran and this quran then will come out uh when it comes into time in the in the person of muhammad sallam in arabia in you know 1400 plus years ago and we're now in the third part of the night so we now have direct access to our Lord who descends to the sky of this world. So what's the next Quranic verse? Well, we could look, so one of the passages I'm working on, I still haven't, I haven't understood yet what to do with it and, and how to really handle all of it. But um, it's about the way that, you know, as you know, it's that, the, that the Quran, especially in translation, can be very difficult to read, um, especially people, a lot of seekers are people who have, in a sense, been, you know, wounded by by religions and and, and spiritual authorities and things like that. Um, so a lot of seekers come to if they're if they're beginning to explore the Quran, explore, explore Islam. Uh, these seekers uh, will have had, you know, they've had enough trauma, let's say, from the Old Testament, uh, you know, from from a very uh, vengeful God and and things like that. Um, and so and the Quran is often translated as if it's the Old Testament. It, it often feels to me that, that the translations are very much, you know, the same thing I'll read if I pick up the Old Testament in a very harsh kind of translation. And so uh, I've always been interested in finding out, well, why is it that Ibn Arabi, when I read the Quran in Ibn Arabi, I understand and it's beautiful and um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing of beauty. And yet when I, when I, read it separately, um, I don't, I don't get that feeling. And I, and I've begun to, to see that Ibn Arabi is, is well, Ibn Arabi says that there's, that he's had a dream where the Kaaba had bricks of gold and silver. And he said, uh, in that, in that dream, they said he saw the Kaaba made of gold and silver bricks, and yet there was a brick missing. And then he says, I am that brick. And so the way I understand that is the brick that's missing, what Ibn Arabi does, is he gives us the full, complete, universal Islam. You know, without Ibn Arabi, a brick is missing, and we can't understand the Quran as something of beauty. And we can't necessarily understand the life of the Prophet Wasallam in a way that we can that we can love and and he becomes our beloved. We can't understand these um because we really need that last brick, and that last brick is what Ibn Arabi does for us, and that's why. Every page has Quran. Every page has the honoring of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this one, this passage that I'm looking at right now, he talks about people who see only beauty. And so, so this is where the people of intimacy and beauty and kindness, when they look into the Quran and into the things, all of them, their eyes do not fall on anything but something fine and beautiful, not on anything but that, whatever it may be. When they recite the Quran, no loathsome figures stand up before them. So no ugly figures stand up before them. Only what is contained there of the beautiful inflected. So he's saying that these are people who, when they read Quran, they don't see loathsome figures. They don't see ugly figures. They don't think terrifying things. They see the beautiful inflected. And this word inflected, very important, saraf. So we say in English, you have sans sarif and sarif fonts. So sarifs are these, are these embellishments. And then sarif is also a word where a money changer. So someone who takes the money and then changes it into another form of money, another currency. That's based on sarafa, sarif. 
and then in Urdu you have Sirf. So Sirf is uh, is is well, the only is is also there is related. So inflection is another way of looking at this word tasarraf. And so inflection is when you inflect something. So they read the Quran and they inflect the words in a way that is beautiful. So uh, we'll take one verse, one verse here from Surah 107, Surah Al-Ma'un. So Yusuf Ali has, these are people who refuse to supply even neighborly needs. So they, they deny the means of assistance. So they stop charity from being given. So this is a, a very strong sentence. It's one that um, you know anyone will feel that this is this is very harsh and it's and it's you, you don't want to really be be feeling this and hearing this all the time it's 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 just kind of depressing that there are people who refuse to give uh uh charity and and and, and ibn arabi is saying there are certain people who read this same verse and they inflect it and here's how they inflect it so we're looking at this statement yamna'un al ma'un they deny or stop up the means of help reaching. So these people, their allotment there is where they veil the people from seeing the secondary causes. So they may turn their view towards the cause of them, the causer, that's Allah. There is no helper but Allah. So these are people who stop people from seeing that charity is being given by them. They want them to see only that Allah is the one who gives. Right. Allah is the one who does. So they are told to say, You alone do we ask for help. You are not helped by the means of help reaching. So they want us to move and inflect this vision into, You alone do we ask for help. So when they look at people who, when they look, when they look out and they say, then they try to deny that there's help being given to poor people. They're trying to stop help being given to the poor people. What they're doing is saying, I want you to see that Allah is giving uh, charity to these people. But Sidi, so, uh, so, sorry to interrupt, but, uh, you know, and I've seen this happen previously as well with Ibn Arabi, but we can see the potential permutation of meaning based on the linguistic meanings of the words, the Quran uh, that are in, in the verse. However, if you then put that verse within context of Surah Ma'un, mm. uh, just th two or three verses back, it says, For waylu lil musallin, wa one to the uh, mm. musallin, the, the worshippers, alladina hum an salatihim sahun, alladina hum yura'una wa yumna'una al ma'un. So, so those who worship in order to be seen, ostentation, you know, uh, f false piety and, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, and as you said, who, who then do not give in charity. So, how would you then square that circle where it says, Woe well, unto the worship your worshippers, but then because that's who's being addressed, right? So, what, what, what Ibn Arabi is doing here, and this is I'm still, still working on how to present this and how to do work with this in a way, he's saying that there's certain people who, when they hear Quran, they don't put their minds onto things that are terrible. There are terrible, horrible things in the world, no doubt about it. And there are evil, arrogant, arrogant people, there are pharaohs, there are all of this, no doubt about it. And so, but when they read it, they see a beautiful inflection. And so the question is, what, what is that beautiful inflection? Like the ones who, who want people to see them, yura'un, they want to be seen. These are the ones who do something in order for others to emulate them. The ones who know God in this community teach people the right action, seeking their education. So these are persons who pray in order to be seen because they want other people to see how to pray. So the first people we know them, we know them very well, the people who pray ostentatiously. And in a way, Ibn Arabi is saying, when you're in love with the divine, when you're in love with the Prophet ﷺ, you really don't care anymore about all these people who are ostentatiously praying. You just sort of forget oh, about see. it. You know, it's, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in, wow, this verse is talking also, or inflectedly, about those people who are teaching. 
and then sahun, the ones who delay their prayer, or the ones who say, there's the one who say that I'm not praying, Allah makes me pray. Allah makes me bend and do ruku. Allah makes me do sajda. So all of this is in Allah's hands. And so they're the ones who, who they, they were saying, I'm delaying the prayer because I'm not the one praying. I'm not the one who has, has effective action. So what he's saying is that when you, when these people on this path who see only the beautiful, they see only the beautiful because they're in love. And so, and when they're in love, all of the, the ugly, petty things that are out there, the vicious things, the violent things, um, they're just not really interested in them. You and there becomes, and, when, and when, you, when you fall in love, you end up realizing that you don't read the newspaper as much as you used to read it. You don't follow mm -hmm. politics as much as you used to follow it. Because that's, you know, that's, that's okay. That's what people do. But when you're in love, you want to hear, you want to see all the beauty. And you can see the beauty in every one of these verses, which sound very harsh or, or sound like, watch out, you people who are praying. Well, of course we're watching out, we're praying, because I'm not praying. Allah, if I pray, it's because Allah made me pray. And so everything is shifted to the beloved and away from me. So he's essentially taking the focus away from almost like a human egocentric perspective to a theocentric yeah. hakika yeah. perspective where right. it's seeing the face wheresoever you turn there is the face of god he's yeah, yeah. seeing and, and 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 this is what ibn arabi does all the time and, and it's so helpful when he does that because i i understand very difficult concepts in him when he starts saying well look at the way allah looks at it he said oh that's kind of crazy but yeah the moment you see it but from allah's perspective then suddenly everything makes sense um so it is it's really something because he'll say he'll say he does talk about you know the the pettiness the viciousness the politics and all of that and he says he was walking along the shore and he met one of the abdal and he's and he just started talking right away about oh in this country we have such an oppressive king a government and the people are so misled and you know just complaining 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 about politics and the one of the one of the abdal and so the man responds to him and he says who are you to put yourself between the slave and his master so this you know the slave is us and the master is allah the creation is not my creation it's not made for me and he says and ibn arabi at one point says even the greatest of us forget that we think the creation, it should be the way it works for me. And so, but the creation is not for me, it's for the one who created. And the one who created it wanted all of these things to happen so that the divine names would all have something to work on. So the divine names would have their, their ability to work. So why isn't everything expansive and generous? Because we need qabid, we need constriction as well. So why isn't everything alive and, and, and healthy? Because we need the mumit, the one who gives death. So each of these divine names have their right. So all of these things have to take place. So the world is the most perfect world that there is, if you see it as the world that was created for the creator, for the creator's own desire. What? And the world is not very nice if you look at it from my perspective, because I wish people were not such jerks, and I think, wish all of these <laughs> other things would happen. And so Ibn Arabi says, so, so if I'm in a situation where the government is oppressive and all these bad things are happening, I have two options. If I complain and try to change things, then um, you know I don't get any reward for putting up with it patiently. If I don't complain, then the government, the king, they're going to be in real trouble on the day of judgment, and I'll be fine because I just was. I was. I'll be rewarded. I'll be good. It's good for me. Uh, if the king is good and I have a good life, then the, my reward is the reward I get in this life, which I have a good life because I live in a country which is run by a very nice king. Um, and so Ibn Arabi says, so if you are someone who sees both worlds, then you are then you are, have all the patience in the world when there is an oppressive tyrant in charge, because you know that, you're, that, you will, that you will have goodness in this next world. And so what it does, and then again, it's, I mean, these, these are hard to handle because we, we, that's not the way we're, we're trained to see, but Ibn Arabi, is a, he is a conveyor, a dragoman of love, of ishq and passion. And so when, when you are in love, those the newspaper doesn't have the same impact as so you say we'd like to read the newspaper we'd like to gaze at the face of your beloved there's your choice <laughs> it's pretty obvious 
No, Sidi, I think um, this is a really interesting point. I mean, it's the 14th of April today, 2022. And mm -hmm. they, if I can slightly sort of off track, just slightly, just based on what you've just said, uh, there's huge amounts of turmoil in the in the world from Ukraine to uh, Pakistan. Uh, I've been yeah. following that quite uh, yeah. intensely, in yeah. fact. Yeah. And um, the, yeah, the overthrowing of Imran Khan's government and and the whole you know the mass the masses of people sort of coming out to to make a stand. I, I get the perspective of the, you know the sort of you know the Taoist monk. What is is and and you know I don't oppose it. I accept everything as it is because it's divine will. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, Islamic history is 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 filled with the warrior saint archetype mm -hmm. from Amir Abdul Qadir Jazari, Tibo Sultan, and others who have made the stand in the face of oppression to the unjust king who to who because they're so selfless manifest aspects of. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jalal and Kahar, you know, and uh, which yeah. are very evident. And in in mm -hmm. a sense, I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, I, 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 obviously, whatever we think about Imran Khan, people sort of agree or disagree. But he 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 seems to be somebody who's very rooted in faith. He starts off with Iyak and Abdul wa Iyak and Astain, and our slogan mm -hmm. is La Ilaha Illallah. Now we have to embed it and stand for serving mm -hmm. none other than the One, not some right. political agenda or money or power status we, we, we're here to make a stand so surely that that is also a manifestation or a a a, a practical application of spirituality because it's a right. there's some element of selflessness involved in that mm -hmm. yeah yeah this this is how Ibn Arabi always takes us back to where we attribute things so do we attribute to me or do we attribute to Allah and he says, so from Quran, we understand that you attribute the bad things to myself and I attribute good things to Allah. And then they all come from Allah. And so with this, the way that we, we handle this is if you're going to, you know, and we have the hadith about, you know, that if there is injustice that you, you stop it with your hand, your mouth or your heart. Um, yeah. And what, what this is doing is, and, and actually the most important is the heart one, because then everything else follows. So if, if I oppose with my heart, then I understand what my position is. Um, if I attribute things to myself, like, like I'm going to make a political movement and I'm going to encourage five people, we're going to go go off and do something, um, and I'm attributing it to myself, then that kind of activism will, if it fails, it's very devastating. You know, it's exhausting. It's exhausting mm -hmm. to fail when you fight against the tyrant. But if I say, if I attribute all to Allah, then I attribute that I, my job right now is to do this or that, and I do that not for my sake or not for the sake of the goal, like overthrowing a tyrant, but for the sake of Allah, then I have all the energy in the world. So if mm -hmm. it fails, uh, it not my, uh, my I didn't fail. Yeah, yes. It's not me failing. And so I'm doing what I need to do. And so so this is how this is how we are always so that they will not forget except illa matansa, only what they, we are made to forget. And we are made to forget that Allah does all. So then we, we think that we do something and then we need to forget that. And so there's always this, there is there is activism, there is standing up uh, for justice, all of these things. Uh, the the only way, what, what we find is that when we stand up for justice without having had that in the heart, but only in the hand, if it's in the hand, then it can be violent, and it can be violence versus violence, and there's really no difference between them. If it's by speaking, uh, it's the same thing. We've just we've just complained about things. Uh, but if it, it starts out with the heart, and then the mouth, and then the hand, then something is quite different. And that is to know when you look at something, you say this is wrong, and this is huck. So that's that's what the heart does. It said this is wrong, and if it's wrong, then we we stand up. But you see, Quran says, and do not. Uh, broadcast zulm do not broadcast oppression except in cases of injustice and what that is saying is that we don't go off and identify all of the time oppression when we do see oppression that needs to be opposed we oppose it as slaves not as the master made a mistake you know the master made a mistake and and put this tyrant in place i oppose it as a slave saying the master wants me to do this and that's what I will do. And then I have all the energy in the world. 
And so each person, the same way with Ijtihad, the same way with Sharia, each person has to decide what is the situation and what is my response to this situation. And the response to the situation has to come from the heart. And, and then we'll find ourselves having strength and encouragement and we won't be devastated if something fails. So this is this is the way Ibn Arabi wants us to move. Um, and and so the key is that we're doing this not because we're trying to make the world a better place, because the world is perfect the way it is. We're trying to do this because we want to, which of the divine names are going to be uh, dominant right now? And is there going to be justice or injustice? And so I do what I do what I you fight for what is just. And if injustice prevails, then injustice prevails. And you then then you die the martyr. In other words, you give up by but you give up because you can't do anything else. And there is no failure at that point, then you're alive, you're Shaheed. And so, and I'm, I don't even mean physical dying. I mean, you mentally, you prepare yourself mm -hmm. to do something and you want to do something and you're thwarted, you're not allowed, you're not able to do that. Um, then you then your, your, your intention it means everything so there there there's going to be activity and action and 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 movement and all of these things but the key is to understand where it's being attributed and for my sake it's important that i attribute uh whatever action i do to allah and then and then watch those divine names uh you know work within me and in me that's wonderful. C Siri, can I, just before we sort of move on, just going back to uh, the Surah Ma'un, just to put my mind at rest, what do you do with the the starting of the verse where it says, فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُسَلِّينَ So, woe to the uh, worshippers. So, so there, there's a clear Arabic word saying, you know, showing some sort of disapproval before the rest comes. So you've given, mashallah, a lovely commentary on mm -hmm. the Akbarian perspective on, on these other inflected meanings. But right. how would you inflect the first verse there? So it's so it starts out so so why you lose so woe to or be careful or be watchful or alert for woe to and and problems are there if um, if you are someone who are, is praying so if I am someone who is praying I have to be very careful and there'll be woe to me if I say I am the one pray, praying and I've got the big eye the big arrogant eye there. If I say that Allah is the one who prays and blesses himself, um, if I say that I am the one whose movements are given by the one who does, the fa'il, that Allah is the only fa'il, the only one who does, and I attribute the prayer to Allah, then it is a beautiful thing. If I attribute the prayer to myself, then I should be warned, and, and someone needs to warn me and say, watch out for a, a but with your attributing the prayer to yourself. So I do not attribute um, the good that I have to myself. So by adab, I attribute the bad to myself, but I attribute the good to Allah. And that's why in Muslim societies and cultures, we always say, mashallah. We say, when someone, when you see someone, a child does something good, you say, mashallah. Because what you want to say is to the child is, you know, you're a wonderful person, but don't attribute it to yourself. Attribute it to Allah. Mm -hmm. And that's the way to live a life. So, mashallah, it's Allah made you do something beautiful and, and recite that poetry so well or to do your homework so well. That was mashallah. That was Allah did that. So, sitting the next verse, do we have time for another verse? Maybe Surah Kafirun? Okay. So, the, the, the people who are uh, the Kafir, so Kafir comes from Kufr, which means to cover. And so let me see if I can find out where we are here. I had it open for a minute and then I lost it. Okay. Okay, come on. Here we go. So so kafirun, so the so the kufar, the kafirun. So these are the ones who cover up their station. So cover up kafara is to cover and satara is to cover. These are the ones who cover up their station. For example, the Malamatiya, so the, the people who blame themselves. So the Malamatiya are very careful about making sure that the, their prayer, Fawailul Musalin, their prayer is always attributed to Allah. And so when they're in the mosque, they never stand in the same place. They never do more than two raka of sunnah. 
They never do anything that makes people look at them because they don't want anyone to see them as special. And so they do the absolute minimum of Islam so that no one looks at them. So they, they are blamed for not being more pious and they blame themselves for trying to be pious. And so they're the ones who are Allah is jealously protective of. So no one should see them. And so they're the shy brides that no one should see them and no one should know how special they are to Allah. So they will never pray in a way that makes people look at them or makes them think that I'm praying, I'm such a great guy doing so many prayers. And so they always attribute to Allah. And the kuffar, the ones who cover up, are the cultivators because they cover the seeds in the earth. And this, and then that's where the rest of this translation, we've already read this. And this is where the people of intimacy and beauty and kindness, when they look into the Quran and into all things, their eyes fall only on the fine and beautiful whatever it may be. When they recite the Quran, no lothum figures stand up before them, only what is contained there of the beautiful turned about. So the kafir is someone Allah has sealed over his heart and his ears and put over his sight a gauzy veil. The kafir among the awliya is someone the true has sealed his heart. You see, Allah has occupied this person's heart to make it his house. My earth and my heaven are not vastly spacious enough for me, but vastly spacious enough for me is the heart of my slave. Allah is jealous, and he does not want a single one of his creation competing with him for the heart. No one else should be in that heart. It is just as he sealed off the sacred precinct, the haram, in which is the Kaaba, so it is not lawful for anyone to hunt its animals or to cut its trees. Indeed, Allah looks only at the heart of the creature. So when Allah seals over the heart of you, this creature, no one but your cherisher enters in your heart. And he sealed over your hearing, so you do not attend to the speech of anyone, only to the speech of your cherisher. Thus, they turn away from vain speech, and over their sights is a gauzy veil. This is a covering of grace. Thus, they never look at a thing, but they see signs pointing to Allah. This veil interposes between the eyes and any sight which would be without indications to Allah. This veil interposes between them and whatever is inappropriate for them to look at. So this is a praiseworthy veil, and they have adab. So adab means torment, but adab also means uthab, sweetness. So the, the, you see, Allah called it a torment using this noun as a favor to the mu'minun because the faithful will find sweet yasta'izabu from adhu, aduba, so will find adab to be sweet, what is painfully felt by enemies of Allah. So it is a torment for these. So Ibn Arabi is saying that, that because Allah is jealous of these special creatures, he seals their heart. And he seals their ears so they can't hear anything. And he, and he covers over their eyes with the veil so that they can't see things that they shouldn't be looking at. So they only see the beautiful. They only see Allah. They only see into their heart. And so these are the special people who are the kufar, the, the, their kafirs, uh, among the awliya. Well, so just to be clear, um, you, you, I've actually got Surah Bakra up in front and you've sort of answered my question before I've asked it. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna ladina kafaru sawa'un alayhim a'un zartahum am lam dunzirhum la yu'minun. Khatam Allah ala qulubihim wa ala sam'ihim wa ala absarihim gushawa. Walahum a'thabun azim. As for those who persist in kufr, disbelief, it is the same whether you warn them or not. They will never believe. They will not have faith. And so Ibn Arabi is not denying the literal exoteric meaning in right. that there is kafirs who this apparently applies to, but right. is also saying they're multiple, this verse is pregnant with multiple levels of right. meaning almost, and one of them applies to the awliya who, are, who cover their station from right. people, and Allah has sealed, Allah has sealed their hearts, hearing, and their sight, so you can't preach to them because uh, they, they they see nothing but the divine. I mean, that's a very right. high station of the Malamadiyah. Yeah. And and that was what I was going to ask you. It's similar to Fawailu lil Musadlin, you know, right. the woe unto the disbelievers. But 
the adab, what about the adab then, what happens? But obviously right. he, he said, going back to the literal meaning of uh, adab from the root, adaba, that it's, yeah. it, there's, there's a sweetness there as well. Yeah. Then what about, uh, if we then take that perspective, when we look at surahs like, قُلْ يَا يُلْكَافْرُونَ لَا أَبْدُ مَا تَعْبَدُونَ I do not worship what, you worship, you know, there's a clear distinction. Well, I am to Abuduna Ma Abud, no worship that, you know, no, 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 will you worship what that which I worship? Well, I am Abudun Ma Batum, and I shall not worship that which you worship. Well, I am to Abuduna Ma Abud, the Kumdi Nikumulia Deen, nor will you worship that which I worship unto your religion and unto me mine. So there's a clear not right. duality but distinction between us and right. them there. And so, yeah. how do you square that? Well, well so let's let's look at three things. Make sure we I get all three of these in. So we'll start with that one. Um, and so that is the Ibn Arabi's position is that aqidah uh, there are qaida there 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 are infinite numbers of aqidahs. Every single human being has their own aqidah. We can agree on an aqidah. We can all agree and say that we'll believe in the books and the angels and things like that. Um, but when it comes to the tajalli of Allah. Allah never repeats twice to one person and never gives the same to two people. So if Allah never reveals him, her itself the same to two people, then the one, the Allah that I worship is not the Allah that you worship because I see Allah and you see Allah and Allah never repeats. So we can never be in the same deen. That's why we call the deen of Allah. Allah's deen is that everyone will have a separate different, unique um, vision and religion and belief system. And so then the second one is la uh, yu'minun. Uh, so they're, they're, you, can, you can warn them or not warn them, they're not going to have faith because faith is, is, is belief in the unseen. And so these ones, they look into their heart, which has been sealed up and only Allah is there because it's been sealed. And when they look at Allah, they see Allah. So it's not based on the unseen. So they don't have faith in Allah. They have sight of Allah because Allah resides in their heart. And they and so and then then we, you as you said, walahum adabu nazim. They have this great torment. So Ibn Arabi does it two times. The Aulia do have a great torment uh, in in this world. They do have a great torment because they the when the prophets and the messengers speak to them, they don't listen to them. And so when they don't listen to them, it looks like they're not going to be guided. And if they're not going to be guided, they're going to be in trouble. And so they do have a great torment in this world because they're not able to function the way the rest of us are able to function because they're, they're, they're the lovers. And these are lovers who are tormented because they nothing satisfies them except Allah. And they are always searching for Allah. They're always waiting for Allah. They're always loving Allah. And so they do have a great torment. But they also have a great sweetness and and a great and that is adab uh, is the adaba means means to get to seek out sweet water so adab is torment and is adaba is to seek and get sweet water so their torment turns into sweet water and this is how even the people in the in the hellfire and jahannam that their torment will turn into sweet uh water and it turns into sweet water when Jabbar puts the foot on Jahannam and says that's it and seals Jahannam and the people who are in Jahannam are the family of Jahannam and her sister is Jannat and there are people who are the family of the Jannat and there are people the family of Jahannam the two sisters and when that sealing takes place their torment turns to sweetness because all will end up in Rahmah everything will end up in rahma whether they are in the hellfire which will turn sweet or whether in the jannat which will be which is mild climate and and sweet and so so ibn Arabi takes there there is is multiple meanings um and they and they and they and each of these are are can speak to a particular insight and that's because if you go to the special face you will can see you can then branch up into They'll, they'll taste, uh, they will have a, a, a tremendous torment. You can bring that up to this and, and the tremendous torment in this world, even of the awliya who suffer because they're lovers of Allah. 
you can bring that up to sweet water that they they will that they will actually have sweet water it will be sweet for them when their hearts are sealed and their ears are sealed it will be sweet for them because all they hear is allah um, and then you can bring it up into another one that those whose hearts are, are, whose ears are sealed and they don't hear the prophets, they do have torment. They do get a tremendous torment because they're unable to be guided. So the special face gives the reality, the truth, and then it comes up into three different ways, right? Just right there. And there'll be more than those three different ways. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sidi. Thank you, Sidi. Should I call you Dr. Eric Winkle or, uh, sorry, Dr. Winkle or Shoyab? Uh, well, when we're talking about Ibn Arabi, Shu'eb is the best because yeah. what, uh, when, when I when I took on the name Shu'eb, I took it on. I was reading Quran and there was you know the Prophet Shu'eb, and I thought, well, that's that's a name I sh I could take on, so I took on that name. And then years later, I realized that Ibn Arabi's best friend is uh, Shu'eb Abu Madian. Wow, <laughs> so, wonderful! So when talking about Ibn Arabi, I go by Shu'eb then. Wow, <laughs> super! Thank you, Sidi Shu'eb. Uh, absolutely. Wonderful talking to you again. May Allah bless your Ramadan and put barakah in your work. And we really look forward to further conversations in the future, inshallah. Yes. So thank you very much. Alhamdulillah.